Football Podcast. Touchdown Ram! Recovered by the Chargers. Touchdown UCLA! With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. What's up, Los Angeles? Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the LA Football Podcast here on the Believe Podcast Network, always on LAFBnetwork.com, your destination for Los Angeles football. Frost is traveling again. I'm telling you this, my man, he's a busy guy. So uh, I'll be riding alone, but I, I welcome in some guests. We're just going to do a quick recap of um, day one of free agency, and then we'll talk a little bit about currently we're in the middle of day two, some, some stuff that's happened today. So I'm going to be joined uh, for the Rams, I'm going to be joined by Sosa Cremendez, um, at QB's MVP on Twitter. Uh, and uh, he re- does the Locked on Rams podcast. So we'll talk a little bit about what the Rams did. And then I'll be joined by Gilbert Menzano from the OC Register to talk what the Chargers did. So it'll be a quick, fun episode, just getting into our LA teams and their free agency. As always, Believe in LA Football podcast is brought to you by betonline.ag. They had prop bets on there for free agency, where certain players landed, where QBs land. Head there, bet on that, parlay them if you want. If not, you can just stick to NBA. March Madness starts on Tuesday. Today's Tuesday. March Madness, I believe, starts on Thursday. Uh, so just two days away, March Madness is like the funnest betting sporting event outside of the Super Bowl. Um, NHL hockey, reality TV, you can bet on The Bachelor, which is uh, wrapping up here soon, 90 Day Fiance. It's all there, betonline.ag. Tell them the guys at LAFB sent you and get 50% welcome bonus when you sign up. That's betonline.ag. All right, I'm going to keep the intro short and sweet. We're going to start off uh, with my buddy Sosa. So let's jump in, talk some Rams feet agency with Sosa Cremendez. All right, Rams fans, what's up? Uh, Excited to talk to you after day one of free agency. We're in the midst of day two as we are recording this live and uh, excited to welcome on a good buddy of mine. You all know him well. Sosa Cremendez does the Locked on Rams podcast, does some fantasy work for PFF, is a Titan mogul on Twitter for the Rams Twitter. What's up, my man? How you doing? I'm good, my man. How are you? I know this is a, a fun time for all of us, obviously, very busy, but... You know, it's, I'm having a good time. Uh, free agency been pretty fun so far. You know, we've gotten some good news, but uh, I'm doing well, my man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking the time. I uh, This is literally, aside from draft season, this is like my favorite off-season week. And of course, as of last week, we randomly applied for a new apartment, signed a lease a day later, and moved all weekend, including yesterday. So it was like the perfect storm of like, okay, I'm anticipating all this free agency stuff. And then I have to move within 48 hours. So I've been a little locked down on that. So I've been, I've been looking to, to you and some other guys to get all the Rams news. So appreciate the work you're doing. Um, but let's just start with uh, the re-signing. You know, Floyd, I think, was someone that a lot of us thought would probably be gone. Uh, me in particular, and the Rams made it an onus to bring him back and not only bring him back, but make him one of the highest paid edge rushers in the NFL. So what's just your initial thoughts on uh, that re-signing? I believe it's four years for $64 million, I think is the initial terms, and we'll get into, uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about how the breakdown works, but what were your initial thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, initially I thought it was a little bit rich, um, but at the end of the day, that's kind of the way, you know, free agency works. You're typically overpaying for talent. Um, and not only that, but, you know, there were reports that came out that the Broncos were after Floyd, um, the Giants were coming after Floyd. So, you know, it makes sense that the price kind of got a little bit high on the Rams there. But when you compare it to some other guys, you've seen Bud Dupree uh, sign with the Titans. I think it was about 16 and a half million per year, some other names like that. But, you know, when you compare it to the other deals, I think it was a little bit rich guys like Shaq Barrett. Um, you look at, you know, Yanni Ngakwe, Matt Judon, two of those guys came in under Floyd's price and uh, Barrett just slightly over so probably a little bit of an overpay but at the end of the day you know it makes sense the Rams love the guy very versatile uh he does a lot of things for the defense one of the best run stuffing edges you look at his contributions as a pass rusher very solid in that regard now you know a little bit inconsistent but with the way they like to stunt up front uh the chemistry that he showed with all the guys up front guys like Aaron Donald you know I think it makes sense obviously at the end of the day you look behind him on the depth chart not much there uh, at the edge spot so Makes a lot of sense, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I can't fault him for making the move. I think it was a little bit rich at the end of the day, but, you know, it's good to have him back. I think if you can get last year's 
sort of, you know, production out of him again, you'd be happy to pay that price. So I think that's kind of what the Rams are banking on here. Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, they obviously know what he brings to the table and, and know the caliber and he does a lot of stuff. I know. So, so you've gotten into it too on your show, but he does a lot of stuff that doesn't show up in the stat sheet. Like, you know, great in the run game, run support and uh, can kind of play all over and be a Swiss army knife and can even drop back in coverage some. Um, so I know they like that versatility for him. Uh, are you concerned at all? You mentioned a little rich and I agree with you. Uh, and the Rams just kind of have a history of overpaying, if you will. You know, we have obviously the cooks, the girly, the golf contracts that are now all still on the books, but not on the team. Does that concern you at all? Or do you think he's, he's been in the league long enough where we know his trajectory where, yeah, maybe overpay, but it's not like in two years, you're going to be trying to deal. him. You know, I am a little bit concerned. I am. Um, it's hard to say. Obviously, we don't know the guarantees yet, so we don't know the full deal. Uh, obviously, you know, sixty-four million. If it's sixty-four million guaranteed, that's a terrible deal. If it's ten million guaranteed, <laughs> yeah. it gives the Rams a lot of outs. So hard to say. You know where they have an out, what year, what kind of structure the contract looks like. But you know, I I would be concerned. Yeah, a little bit. You look at Leonard Floyd. I mean, he's been in the league for five years now, and his last year in Chicago, I mean, he had three sacks, and his fifth-year option was declined by the Bears, who drafted him in the top ten. So he was, you know, a relative disappointment before he got to L.A. And so, um, you know, he picked up his production, obviously a very good thing, but at the end of the day, that did come in a contract year. That's always something to be wary of. Guys obviously have a little bit more incentive to play a little bit, you know, better football when it comes to being on a one-year deal. And so that might have been something to be, you know, a little bit motivating for him, but at the end of the day, you know, I think the Rams know what they're getting out of Floyd. Very solid run defender, very, you know, decent pass rusher, not very consistent, not going to put up those gaudy sack numbers. I don't think he's going to have many high quality wins as a pass rusher, but a guy that can, you know, be very athletic off the edge, do a lot of stunts up front, a lot of different things. If you have the right expectation level, then I think you're going to be pretty happy with what you get out of Leonard Floyd. But if you're expecting, you know, this 28, 29 year old guy to take this next step and become this 15 sack a uh, high quality pass rusher, Shaq Barrett kind of guy. Yeah. You're going to be disappointed. So I think the Rams know what they're getting. And I think ultimately they were happy to pay that price. Yeah. I, I think we're in agreement there. G- glad to have him back. Last, last thing referring to him and then we'll move on. Um, obviously the deal's done. We're happy he's back in LA, but would you have rather two days ago seen them go after a more budget guy, not a guy, maybe even at the same caliber, but a guy that can still give you some production, maybe give you that five to seven to eight sacks. If they're alongside Donald, maybe that jumps to 10 sacks, but they could get for eight, 9 million as opposed to the 16 they're paying or, or were you kind of wanting them to go after Floyd, no matter what it took? I would say I was in the former, you know, I think that we look at guys like Dante Fowler came uh, and had a career next, next to uh, Aaron Donald. You look at Floyd has a career year next to Aaron Donald. Uh, I think they could have did that again. And I'm not in the camp of, you know, continue to add guys for one year, wash and repeat, wash, repeat kind of thing. But, you know, I look at the pass rusher market and there's still some very good names out there. Guys like Melvin Ingram specifically, a name that I've highlighted many times over the last few weeks. I think he's going to have to take a lot less money. Barely played last season. I think he played five games and you've seen all the other edge rushers, the big name guys all get paid and deservedly. So I think we expected that from, you know, the big names. No one was really surprising yesterday, but when you look at a guy like Ingram, I mean, he's been in the league for a decade, been a supremely productive guy, one of the more underrated players in the NFL and barely played last season. And now he's like 32, I think obviously going to want, you know, to ring chase a little bit and probably sign a short-term deal, one-year deal, rehab a value, rehab his value, sorry, um, you know, get like 16 games under his belt and then maybe hit the market again next year when the cap rises and when he's got 16 games under his belt and a strong season to go off of. Uh, so, you know, I think they could have signed someone like that. I don't know what the price tag is going to be. You know, who knows how long he's going to have to wait to get signed. But at the end of the day, if he signs for 10, you know, $12 million, I would much rather go that route. But, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, I do understand, you know, the, the consistency that you get out of Leonard Floyd. You know what you're getting. And uh, that's a very solid, amazing edge rusher, actually, uh, in terms of the run stuff and capabilities. But, you know, you can chip in a little bit as a pass rusher. So I get why the Rams went with that route, but I think there definitely was a lot better value when it comes to some of the free agent names that were available. Yeah, Ingram would have been obviously a great one, and they, they could have get. We'll see what his market is. Like you said, I'm sure he'll kind of wait towards the back end to sign a deal, um, see what's left out there. I was even in the camp. And I was probably, I was probably scraping into the barrel that a lot of, not a lot of people agree with, but I was even like Tack McKinley, Vic Beasley, Jeremiah, a Tachu from Denver guys you could get for that. Cause you know, Tack and, and Vic have had some success, but I think they're 
they had really bad success last year. Tack, I didn't really even play when he signed with the Raiders and, and Vic please, he's been real up and down his whole career. So guys like that, that, Hey, come and prove yourself, play alongside Darnold. You can get for really, really on the cheap, but, um, you know, we'll see. And they have a guy obviously, in, you know, Terrell Lewis, who, if he can stay healthy, he's another beast that can rush the passer, but again, can he stay healthy? We'll see. So, you know, mm-hmm. they got their guy, obviously they really wanted him felt he was important to the team and, you know, who are we to argue that? But yeah, I agree with you that there, I think there was some other value that we could, we could attest um, and help him with that cap number, but we'll, uh, we'll see how it pays off and we'll see what happens, you know, two, three years down the line, if we're having this conversation again about all these restructures and, and going after someone else. So um, let's move over to your boy, D will, who they gave a first round tender. I know your answer, but was that too rich or was that right where it should be to make sure he was a part of this organization for future? Yeah, it's right where it should be. You know, at the end of the day, um, getting him basically guaranteed back. I don't think anyone's going to be willing to part with a first round pick on top of paying, you know, $15 million a year or whatever it might cost. That's important. That's the most important facet of it all, getting him back and getting him back in the building next to Jalen Ramsey. So you have the best duo at corner returning. That's, you know, the most important facet here. But then when you look at the other aspect of it too, you know, it's nice to reward your players. I mean, what's one and a half million dollars at the end of the day to a team that, you know, it's just, flushing money out of wherever they want. Like, you know, they could restructure all these different contracts. Uh, You want to take care of your guys. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, that kind of good faith stuff goes a long way when it comes to the negotiating table at some point, you know, maybe even now uh, the Rams could be negotiating something long-term with Darius Williams, which I hope they are. Uh, He's, you know, still a relatively, you know, young guy. I think he's 27 or 28, probably still has his best football ahead of him. Not much tread on the tires. Hasn't played, you know, a lot of legit, on field stuff over the past, you know, couple of years. So mm-hmm. I think this is a guy that you want to invest in long term. You got two very good corners, two probably top 15 corners, top 10 corners right now. These guys are so good. It's a passing league. You've seen um what a dominant secondary can do for, you know, your defense last year it was the best defense in the NFL, no questions asked. And you might lose Troy Hill. You lost John Johnson. So some continuity at that spot, in my opinion, is obviously wise. And uh, you know, I don't think there's much to budge about when it comes to that one and a half you know, $2 million difference from the first round tender to the second round tender. I think it was wise for the Rams to just make sure that he's back in the building. And ultimately that's what is most likely going to happen at this point. hundred percent. And obviously if they're giving him a first round tender, I would assume that they definitely want him around long-term because you don't, you don't give that out. It's actually, I feel like fairly rare to see those first round tenders go usually the second, third, or much more, um, um, consistent i guess or, or more scenes so uh you know obviously they love him in the building and want him around and so that's what they're going to do to keep him around um now i saw no full numbers have been disclosed but i saw that uh with a bunch of restructures the rams are close to breaking even and then with floyd's contract they're back to about that negative 16 mil and then starting tomorrow they can start restructuring stafford when it's official which will get them back to that you know good in the black range now, I just saw, as we started recording, the Titans released a Dory Jackson. Um, now, I would assume the Rams would still probably rather just maybe keep their own blood, keep Troy Hill around and get him to a deal. Um, I don't even know if you saw that news or if you're just hearing about it right now, but, you know, you, Dory Jackson, I'm always biased to guys that played here in L.A., the, the great USC product, uh, and I would love to see him back here in Los Angeles. Do you think if, the, if they could get under the cap enough and give him a, a fairly decent deal, do you think that's a good fit, or you'd rather just see them try to get Troy Hill signed? You know, I think there's a lot of quality at the cornerback spot. I don't think they have to be pigeonholed into trying to resign Troy Hill. Um, if for whatever reason he wants to, you know, move on or go start somewhere or just get more money than the Rams can offer. I think they absolutely should look at the cornerback market. Adoree Jackson is an interesting name, obviously a former first round pick, a guy who has return capabilities as well. So that could be a, you know, a good additive for the Rams mm-hmm. very fast, but you know, I remember even looking back at the draft a few years ago, a lot of Rams fans, obviously a lot of crossover with the USC fans as well, uh, were dying for him. They wanted the Rams to go get him. I did not really love his tape, to be quite honest with you. I thought he left a lot to be desired from in terms of a technique standpoint. But, um, you know, the Rams have done a good job at developing corners. And at the end of the day, he's only going to be the third corner if he does get added. So, you know, I'd be more than willing to do that. But, um, you know, there's a lot of good names on this cornerback list. I pulled it up here. And, you know, there's a lot of good names that are intriguing to me here. And it depends on obviously what the Rams want to do in terms of the price. And, you know, if they want to sign guys that were cut and not affect the comp pick formula, that kind of thing. Um, that's another factor that plays in that. I guess, you know, Adoree Jackson does have as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think they're pigeonholed at all. I think there's probably, you know, off the top of my head, maybe five, six, seven really good quality 
guys that I think could walk in the door and start from day one at that nickel spot. And I think Adoree Jackson would be one of those guys. So, you know, if the Rams do ultimately go that route, I, I would be pleased with that. I think, um, you know, with his punt return capabilities as well, that's something that he adds to the return game as well as, you know, just developing as a corner. He's still a very young guy. So I think there, you know, is a lot more in terms of the potential there. So I, I could, uh, I could definitely live with that move. Yeah. Anytime I see a, a Trojan or a Bruin on the market, I'm always like, bring them home. Bring them up. I don't know why. I just have a soft spot for that. So, um, all right, we'll get you here out of here on this. So, uh, also today, John Ross, a guy that a lot of us, myself included linked to the Rams as a good fit as a, as that need for a burner receiver, uh, signed with the Giants. So he is off the market. Um, so we'll end with this receivers and beyond. So it doesn't have to just stick to receivers, but who are maybe some guys again, considering the Rams, let's say they can get to, five million in spending money. I don't think we're going to get much, much higher than that, but if we can get to that five to seven extra cash flow, where maybe they could bring in one more guy who is a guy, whether it's receiver or any position that you're kind of looking at that like, Hey, this is a guy I want to see them go after. If you've gotten that far. (laughs) I've definitely gotten that far. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So, you know, Ingram, the guy we talked about earlier, Oh man, I would just love to see that pairing Melvin Ingram, uh, Leonard Floyd at the edge spots, Aaron Donald in the middle. You can never have too many edge guys. Like fancy to know that you can guys. have as many edge guys as, as possible. Right. I mean, three, three or four is not too much. So um, Melvin Ingram, a guy I would love to see. And then I look at the offensive line, not necessarily because the offensive line is a major weakness for the Rams, but um, just, you know, the names that are available, it, it's absurd. It, like, especially the interior, we're not talking about necessarily the tackles, which is a good thing for the Rams because, mm-hmm. you know, I think they're pretty happy with Whitworth and Havenstein. So um, that's not really a discussion, but when it comes to that interior trio, Maybe even specifically at that center spot, Austin Blythe is a free agent. The one name, and I don't know if you've seen it, just got released a few hours ago, Rodney Hudson of the mm-hmm. Las Vegas Raiders. The <laughs> they released everybody. Yeah, that's four offensive linemen now. I don't know what their plan is, but uh, prayers to uh, Derek Carr because it's probably not going to be fun for him next year. But no. Rodney Hudson, you know, obviously the money is going to be an issue. I think this is probably the best center on the market right now. One of the best centers in the NFL, no questions asked, in my opinion deserving of a big, big contract, but um, you know, I don't know how much teams you can be willing to spend at this point in time. So that's a guy I would love to see, but you know, there are multiple guards as well. Some guys like Trey Turner from the chargers, uh, Gabe Jackson, also from the Raiders, Richie incognito, a name that I'm intrigued by. And Larry Warford is a name that really intrigues me. A guy who took the last year off. I think it was due to COVID um, has four years of experience with Matthew Stafford played with him in Detroit. So, you know, there's some familiarity and, you know, continuity there. And uh, ultimately, if the Rams can upgrade one of those guard spots for a cost effective, uh, cost effective option, you know, that's something I would look forward to. But um, if they do, for whatever reason, just want to upgrade from Austin Blythe at the center spot or Blythe does ultimately walk, I would definitely look at Rodney Hudson there as well. You know, it's hard to say with the money, obviously, how much they're willing to spend and how much a guy like Hudson would demand on the open market. But at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of potential for offense, offensive line upgrades here. And uh, I think the Rams should take a look at that if they can, you know, find a way to afford one of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a ton of options. That seemed to be the position that every team was skimming to get under the cap. Uh, and you see all these all pro or, or pro bowl players now on the open market and probably going to get less money than they deserve necessarily, but they'll re up in the next years. Uh, you know, I remember Russell Wilson came out or his camp came out a few weeks ago and said the Raiders were a destination to be interested. And in. I don't think he would be anymore after that offensive line reconstruction going on, um, which is yeah. Interesting enough. So uh, well, Sosa Cremendez, you're the man, dude. Uh, keep up the great work. Appreciate you taking some time in this in this busy week. Uh, we'll obviously do this again soon. And uh, that new microphone is sounding crispy as hell. So congrats. I want that thing so bad. Yeah, it's uh, money well spent. I appreciate you for having me, my man. It's been a fun week. Hopefully we get a little bit more traction here, a little bit more news for us to cover. But, um, you know, I'm ready for, for everything and uh, I'm ready to get back on here whenever you want me. So I uh, appreciate you, my man. Always do anytime. Yeah. We'll see if we can get a alignment or maybe a speedy receiver and then it's on to uh, on the draft season, which will be plenty busy with that. So um, stay safe, stay healthy, dude. We'll talk. Uh, I'm sure talk here very soon. So thanks again. All right. Big thanks to Sosa. We'll always love talking to him. I love doing these because now these are all I consider friends of mine now that I've been doing this. So awesome. Sosa's always got good stuff as well. Uh, before I get to Gilbert, want to give a brief moment to talk about our newest sponsor, eBay. Um, whether rare dead stock or the latest release, find the exact shoe you're looking for. So heads up all those sneaker heads out there. eBay is the original sneaker marketplace and is the place to go to cop the pair you've been eyeing. With eBay's authenticity guarantee, your sneakers are meticulously inspected by independent professional authenticators. 
Each sneaker also receives an authenticity guarantee tag that includes a digital stamp of authenticity. It also protects sellers with a verified return process. So for sneaker sellers out there, eBay has now eliminated selling fees. Uh, sneakers are $100 and up, making it free to sell or flip your collection. So go to ebay.com slash sneakers. That's ebay.com slash sneakers. Tell them the guys at LFB sent you the world's best destination for discovering great value and unique selection. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into now conversation with Gilbert, another great friend of mine. So Chargers fans out there, stick around and uh, let's talk about this great day one of free agency for your Los Angeles Chargers. All right, Chargers fans. So uh, we just finished up with the Rams. Let's jump in the Chargers now who have had a much more active free agency, obviously had a lot more money to spend, which is a little more exciting. Uh, Chargers Twitter had a meltdown yesterday, but then, you know, got back on track later in the afternoon. So to talk all about it, all of yesterday's news, plus what's gone on today, a uh, good buddy of mine, you know him well, Gilbert Manzano, uh, one of the titans of Chargers Twitter, also writes for the OC Register, the LA Daily News, uh, does podcasting now, he does it all. Gilbert, what's up, my man? How you doing? I'm doing well. It's funny you mentioned the meltdown, Ryan, because I think about 24 hours ago, people were freaking out. Why aren't the Chargers doing anything? And then I don't know where they're signing players left and right. So it's a little chaotic and I can't really keep up, but I'm trying my best. Yeah. The frenzy is always the best. It's my, one of my favorite times of year. Uh, I talked about it with you before recording. I talked about it. You know, our fans heard it because I talked about it on the last interview, but process of moving worst timing possible, but Hey, do what you got to do. We still got news out. We still cut some stuff out for LAFB, but before we jump into it, man, saw you in a our good friend Fernando launched a podcast. Tell me about it. What's going on with that? Yeah, we just saw the connection you have with, with Frosty Rucker. And I'm like, you know what? I want that. And I, the first person I thought about was Fernando Ramirez uh, from Sports Illustrated. Uh, people have said, well, you know, we're a good uh, duo. So I said, uh, why not do a podcast? Because Fernando kept uh, having me on for his Q&A videos on YouTube. And mm -hmm. we got some good uh, feedback, some good support. People were liking it. And I was like, we got to think bigger, Fernando. Like, I, we, we got we to go large in 2021. So we started uh, Compass on the Beat. If you don't know what Compass means, uh, friend in Spanish, but Ryan, you know that. Uh, uh, you're my compa as well. Uh, but if uh, you, you guys uh, are into podcasts, give it a listen. Uh, Compass on the Beat uh, is already uh, on Apple and Spotify. Sound I'm like a professional saying that. It's just kind of crazy to think. I was going to get a little random, Pox NFL, some culture stuff, and how we kind of came about in the business, uh, Fernando and I. Uh, we'll have the next one uh, coming out. Uh, next week and uh we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna just work for this free agency frenzy uh and not let the podcast and get out get, get in the way so i'm gonna just be a reporter for today for this week and then next week <laughs> i'll get my podcasting on with fernando there we go compas on the beats it's all all just uh what should i say not necessarily well i mean you still do journalism you talk charge and stuff but it's more like fun just get on there a little looser have a good time uh, be friends, right? So that's the, that's what podcasting is anyway. I and mean, that's what I try to yeah, do. I like yeah. So exactly. Uh, I've checked it out though. I'm stoked you guys are doing it. So, uh, you know, now you guys got to just get sponsored by, you know, taco trucks and, and all the local <laughs> flavor and stuff. And you'll be, you'll be off. And We're hoping, Ryan. You really are. You got to think big. You said, think big. That's the LA mantra right there. So, um, you guys, rec you said, obviously this week is different, but you guys record what once a week is right now what you're doing. Yes, we're uh, we're hoping uh, on Tuesdays because you know when the season comes, we're gonna be pretty crazy with with uh, you know we're being reporters. But on Tuesday is usually the day off for NFL, so that could be the day we would kind of like kick back, uh, start recording a podcast, talk about some stories, talk about what's going on in the NFL world, and uh, see how it goes. Perfect. There you go. So look for it on Tuesdays. But all right, Gilbert, let's get into what happened thus far with the Chargers. Um, let's start first with uh, Michael Davis. I think that was a huge key re-sign um it seemed like i mean it is big money pretty big money for for him who's a very good player well deserved but the way the contract works out it actually is very very team friendly too which seems to be the mo of tom telesco and that staff there how they are just geniuses working the cap and getting these you know backloaded contracts or avoidable years or whatnot um because i want to say his like cap hit i don't have it in front of you but it was like 4.4 this year and like 6.8 next year or something crazy but he's making good terms so it is what was just your thoughts at first uh hearing he i think he even had offers bigger offers from other teams but chose to stay here in la with the chargers and, and take that contract so what are your initial thoughts on that yeah uh 
you know, we just spoke to Michael Davis not too long ago, and he said he wanted to go to Utah to clear his mind, kind of like that background you have there, the, the, the mountains that are covered in snow. So Michael mm -hmm. went to, to Utah. He, he, he played college football at BYU. Mm -hmm. But he just said he had no idea what was going to happen, and if he felt like a little uneasy about it. And he, he didn't want to, you know, just assume that Charles were going to call. Or, and But he had a bunch of phone calls from multiple teams and, and different offers. So uh, when you have people throwing money at you and, uh, and the way that uh, kind of, you know, Michael kind of came up, he was an undrafted free agent. Uh, he was raised by a single mother from Mexico. Uh, so, you know, obviously, you know, having financial security meant a lot to him. But the Chargers came hard as well. Maybe the, the numbers weren't as big, but they came with some guaranteed money that was pretty mm -hmm. big, $15 million dollars. And that's kind of what you're seeing in today's NFL that, hey, can you help us out with the, with the cap hit and we'll give you more guaranteed money. So that's kind of what happened here. But I think for the charge, it was a, it was a good move. I was a big fan of Michael Davis uh, this past season, 2020. He, he was very inconsistent, 2018, 2019. And he said it himself today that, you know, that it didn't really click until after the week five game against the Saints. Uh, he he kind of gave up some big plays, even in that Buccaneers game where he had a pick six against a, against sorry against Tom Brady, which is a memorable highlight for him to get a pick six on the on the goat. But he gave up some big plays in that game, and so he and he did the same thing as the Saints the following week. And then he said it finally just kind of clicked. He was consistent. He was his speed, his size, and teams in the NFL loves. So that's why he had a lot of teams interested. And after the Chargers released Casey Hayward, uh, you know they were a little older in the second there with Chris Harris Jr., who was still productive of last year, but they were a little thin, a little older. So I think he must have been a priority for the Chargers to retain Michael Davis. So I think for both sides, it's, uh, you know, I think they deserve credit for getting it done. And I think they it needed to get done because they were so thin in that position. So I think overall it worked out for the Chargers pretty well. Yeah. You know, I, I think as soon as they released Casey Hayward, that became kind of priority number one for them um, to either get a corner or retain Davis. And I was always wanting them to keep Davis just because, you know, have that continuity. And, and I, like you said, I think he played really well last year, especially down the stretch, just got better and better. And I'm extremely excited to see what Brandon Staley can do with him and uh, Ronaldo Hill as the defensive coordinator and what they can uh, just continue to improve him. And, and you mentioned it before, I, I just love his story too. So when these guys get these big contracts, I'm like so stoked for them and, and yeah, his story. And I remember when the Mexico city game happened, he had a, a really good following down there, which is so cool to see. And um, so yeah, happy he's back in LA. That was a good way to start the free agency when, when Twitter was on fire, uh, charter Twitter that is. And okay. Then there was some good news there. And then all of a sudden it went from fire to just pure elation when kind of the golden goose the big fish of free agency, aside from maybe Joe Thune, was Corey Lindsley. And here he is going to be a charger snapping the ball to Justin Herbert. So what do you think of that one? Yeah, sometimes uh, things that are so obvious, do you think they're not going to happen because it's, it's mm -hmm. too good to be true, too good of a, a nice fit for, for the Chargers. And everybody had Corey Lindsley from the Packers, this all pro center as a need, and they're going to go after him. And and we kind of thought, thought the same with John Johnson from the Rams. That was not the case. But with Corey Lindsley, that was the case. The Chargers were thinking the same as us, as we would like to say, the pundits and reporters. Uh, it needed to upgrade uh, on the offensive line, especially in the interior. Uh, I know Tom Telesco, the GM of the Chargers, doesn't, didn't want to say flat out that, you know, they have a big need at, on the offensive line. He wanted, But he said their running efficiency was not that great a year ago, and that definitely means inside blocking. And you go out and get the best center in the NFL and Corey, Corey Lindsley, you gave yourself a drastic upgrade uh, with getting him to all pro last year who worked with Aaron, Rod Aaron Rodgers. So I think he was a home run hit uh, or signing, I should say. Uh, they needed him uh, and he got his money in return. And that's why that why, you know, Telesco felt they were in a good place because they had a, you know, they had cap money to spend. They weren't in a bad place, like say like the Rams or the Eagles or the Saints. Mm -hmm. Uh, they weren't worried about that. So they had the money to spend. And you, when you're at that point, you kind of make yourself a wish list. You go after somebody. And I'm guessing Corey was at the top. So I think for them, along with Michael Davis, that, that is why they should rece receive an A grade in my book uh, for getting those two signings in day one of uh, free agency. Yeah, you said it perfectly. Corey Lindsley was just made too much sense that sometimes I find myself doing this where I'm like, okay, I'm going to think outside the box and who's someone that no one else is talking about that they're actually going to sign because this guy just, he makes too much sense. And well, luckily they, they went after the guy that made sense because they made sense. And I think that's, you know, we'll fortify that line. Obviously there's a connection with Brian Balaga there as they played in Green Bay together. Right. Um, and then uh, you know, they can, they can still in the draft if they want to go after a tackle at 13, since they've short up the inside and they short up the inside even more 
with this next guy we'll talk about, Matt Feeler, who uh, they got from Pittsburgh. But he has a ton of versatility. I know they'll probably line him up at right guard, at least we can assume that right now. Um, obviously that can change, but he has versatility playing at right tackle at playing inside. I think he's even played a little center. So to me, guys like that are fantastic to bring in because we see how injuries have had it into this charter team, especially the offensive line, especially to Brian Balaga last year. So if you have a guy that can kick outside if needed, I think that's a home run too. And they got him for fairly cheap. So what were your thoughts on the, on the feeler signing? Yeah. You know, I think that was kind of icing on the cake on day one of free agency frenzy. I know uh, people don't know too much about feeler, but if you start looking at his background, like you mentioned, Ryan, this guy is versatile and he's also pretty good uh, interior lineman. And I, and going back to the Tom Telesco, he's he's tried in years past to fix his offensive line. He swung and missed many times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to say not, not many times, but he in 2017, he drafted three linemen, Lamb, Tebby, Feeney. They didn't work out. He signed in 2018, Mike Pouncey, Russell Kuhn. It kind of worked, but not Two, just for one year mm-hmm. and then uh last year brian bulaga got hurt traded for trey turner he got hurt so he's been trying throwing you know draft capital money trades to fix offensive line and it has not worked out so the good thing about tom telesco he's very you know savvy with the contracts so when it doesn't work out he could get rid of the contract it's not in the books try again but i think this one feels right hopefully mm-hmm. because of the Matt, uh, hopefully I'm saying his last name right, Feeler, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. And hopefully, uh, I, I we'll talk to him soon, and I'll, and I'll make sure that I'm saying his last name. <laughs> Feeler correctly. or Feiler? It's it's uh, one of those. Yeah, Feeler. Okay, I'm just going with Feeler or Feiler. And, and again, I apologize. Uh, but when I saw that he could play right tackle as well, because you feel the starter at left guard potentially, or who knows, even right guard. But you have somebody at that guard spot now who's very talented as well. I started doing some digging and, and, and how many he's, he's allowed a little a low amount of pressures in the last couple of years. But after what happened with Bulaga, I think Telesco was like, hey, I've learned my lesson. Injuries happen. We got to have versatility. And in case Bulaga again is injured, we have this guy now to back him up. Uh, so I think that was a, a big addition for the Chargers. So you got your star player in Corian Lisley. And then you got yourself another starter and a potential backup later that day. So I think Monday was a terrific day for the Chargers to get those three guys. Home run day, I think. And I agree with you that it feels really good. I hope that's the case because if I'm being honest, last year trading for Trey Turner and signing Brian Bulaga felt really good too. Um, I was pretty ecstatic about both of those. I was like, this is going to be a slam dunk. And then we saw how it worked out. And, you know, you can't foresee these injuries. Trey Turner, I think, was fairly healthy most of his career and just got a stretch of bad luck here. And Bulaga did have some injury concern, but not like he had here in L.A. So, um, but I just think this one for sure, like Lindsey, I mean, he's an all pro. Pro Bowl all pro is very different. He's an all pro. And then you mentioned Feeler with his versatility. So um, a fantastic first day. Um, and then day two. So we, we both super busy on day one. You talked pre-air, you were, you know, 15 hours putting them work. Yeah. So we're like, okay, maybe we can get some breathing room and start our day off on Tuesday. Not even late, just like at a normal, respectable, like when the stock exchange opens or something on the East Coast. I don't know, something at a normal time. And then we get the news that no one wanted to hear uh, in the Bolt fam. Hunter Henry signs with the Patriots. So were you uh, were you up for that or did you, uh, did you miss it like myself? I slept literally till 8 o'clock. I didn't even sleep in, but. I missed it. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. Like, you know, I, I went to bed, like, maybe close to 1 in the morning. And, like, I think I, I really mentally checked that around 10. Yeah, I just wanted to unwind, watch some Netflix. Uh, I went to bed around 1 in the morning. And then I set a bunch of alarms at uh, 6 in the morning, 6.30, 7 o'clock. But then you kind of hit snooze and you want to steal some more extra minutes of sleeping time there, mm-hmm. uh, which I did. And sure enough, when I hit snooze, Hunter Henry... Uh, according to Adam Schefter, was going to the Patriots, and so I had to kind of get up, and you know, it was a little chaotic, and write a story about Hunter Henry leaving. But Ryan, I gotta say, I, I was surprised when I saw the news after kind of I was a uh, you know wide awake uh, <laughs> after what they did the day prior. I didn't think they're gonna be in the market for a tight end, uh, and for them to go out and and and, and pair him with Jonu Smith, Hunter Henry, that's a, that's a scary duo for for uh, for opposing teams. Uh, but now the Chargers are left with a big hole at tight end. And I just started thinking about all the possibilities. It's a little intriguing, a little exciting, but they're, 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 they are going to miss Hunter Henry's presence as, as a leader and as a very productive tight end who could block and be very productive in the passing game. 
Yeah, huge loss. A guy that they drafted, uh, you know, homegrown here and obviously had some injuries, but was a very good player when was on the field. And yeah, I agree with you because my thought was all leading up to this, if they did not bring back Hunter Henry, I like John U. Smith as a potential replacement for him. And then now both of those guys are going to be playing for the Patriots to kind of remake that uh, Aaron Hernandez and uh, Rob Gronkowski duo they had from 2010 to 2012. Um, the interesting thing is I remember when Henry at one point, I don't know if it was a press interview or it just came out on social media or what, but I remember him saying, uh, he would like to stay, but he wanted to make sure he played somewhere with it, with a good quarterback. And he's going to somewhere with whatever, everyone thinks about Cam Newton, but arguably one of the poorer passing quarterbacks in today's NFL, you know, after last year throwing what five total touchdowns, uh, through the air. So, so that's, you know, sometimes money does talk and, you know, happy for him that he, he got paid, but. Definitely a big loss for the Chargers, who uh, have a big hole. You know, I think the, the slotted starter right now is XF, X, XFLer Donald Parham, who uh, had some bright spots last year, but, you know, limited play and, and not a lot of actual catches. So do you think they'll still go after someone in free agency, or do you think they'll now wait to the draft? Yeah, I, I think uh, free agency should be an option for tight end, especially because there's still some good, you know, talent out there. Uh, you know, Jared Cook, I think you mentioned Ryan on Twitter that he has connection with Frank Smith from their days with the Raiders, who Frank Smith mm-hmm. was a former tight end coach with the Raiders, now the offensive line run game coordinator with the Chargers. So, and obviously Jared Cook has experience with uh, Joe Lombardi, the OC from the Chargers from the days in New Orleans. So that, that seems like an easy fit, another obvious thing. Um, but maybe you draft one in the middle rounds, you know, third, fourth, fifth, uh, I kept tweet, tweeting about Kyle Pitts and because I, I used to kind of ignore Kyle because, you know, this guy's a, a freak of an athlete, but the Chargers weren't going to get him, I felt like. And then Henry left like, all right, let me get excited about this guy. Yeah. There's a chance maybe, maybe teams go heavy on linemen and maybe they go heavy on cornerbacks and then quarterbacks and he's there. But I don't really see that being a realistic option that he's going to be at, there at number 13 for the Chargers. So maybe get one in the middle rounds. Or I think this might be the way to go is, call the Eagles and offer uh, maybe a fourth round pick. I know they want a third round pick to get tight end, former pro bowler tight end uh, Zach Kurtz, who, who I think was born in, in Orange County, maybe even raised there before he went to the Bay area. So he has local ties. And um, I think Zach Kurtz is very eager to prove that uh, last year was a, was a, I guess a, a weird year and he's ready to bounce back and be a pro bowler and to connect him with Justin Herbert for, for a prove it year deal. I think the charge to go that route, but uh, they're not limited to charges in terms of options. Uh, they're going to explore, obviously, free agency and, and, and trades and, and, and the draft. Uh, and I know you mentioned Donald Parham Jr. Uh, he's still a very uh, good red zone, red zone threat, but he still has a lot of room to improve in terms of blocking and stuff like that. So I think they still they might even get a tight end or two uh, to kind of you know, go, go with uh, Parham. Yeah, you don't want to go into a training camp with Parham as your slotted starter. Um, definitely a great depth guy that, like you said, can play great in the red zone. And to me, Zach Ertz is an absolute home run. Um, if anyone out there is willing to spend a 13 or even trade up for a guy like Kyle Pitts, who is a generational player in talent, but let's not forget, you know, Zach Ertz is a top three tight end. I know he had a down year last year, but it was just a mess in Philadelphia years prior. It was, it was Kelsey. It was Kittle and Zach Ertz. Like it was those three guys for a solid number of years. He was just dominant. And if you can get him for, I'd even be willing, a lot of people wouldn't, but I'd even be willing to part with a second. I agree with you. A fourth would be a slam dunk. But I think if you can get a guy like that to come in with Justin Herbert, pair him with Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, uh, you now fortified the offensive line. You can still use that 13th pick for another offensive lineman. And then you just keep kind of building depth pieces on the on the defense that has a lot of returning guys that are solid, but you also have a defensive line and coach that will use guys the way they should. Zach Ertz to me is a slam dunk. So I'm glad you brought that up, Gilbert, because if they can get that done, that makes the most sense to me. If they want to just be cheaper, uh, Kyle Rudolph is another option, veteran guy who doesn't have really the numbers that Joe for, but phenomenal inline blocker can get catches when you need him. Um, so sure handed. And then, uh, you know, everyone still says Gerald ever just because of the connection with Staley. I don't think that's going to happen, uh, but he's just another option out there as well. So there's, there's a few options, but yeah, bummer to lose Henry. Um, but I think Zach Ertz would be a slam dunk hundred percent. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that because they have so many weapons. And if you bring in a guy like Zach Ertz, and I'm just intrigued to see how that that combination could, could do. But but you're right, Hunter Henry is going to be a big loss, but they're not limited for options, the Chargers. Yeah, and every year in the draft, there's tight ends that get drafted in mid-rounds that end up you know playing great. I know like the Rams last year took Bryson Hopkins in the fourth round, and no one really knew who he was or what he could do. And this year, he'll be kind of one of the top guys for this Rams offense. So there's always guys deeper in the draft that could end up 
um, having some success. So, um, but yeah, that was the big news. I guess the last thing we'll get to is Mike Badgley, the money badger. I don't know if he still deserves that nickname right now, or maybe he does because he got another contract, but, but he's back for the chargers. Do you think they still bring in some competition or is he, is he the guy, the kicker going forward for this team? Yeah, I think right now it's still his job. Uh, like you mentioned, they brought him back on a one-year contract. Um, but I think he does has com- he's going to have competition. They 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 actually signed the kicker a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. And uh, I right. want to say Tristan Vizcaino. Hopefully, mm-hmm. I'm getting his name right. Uh, but he doesn't have a lot of experience kicking in the NFL. I know. I think he was three for three with the Niners a year ago. I, I forget. I got to do 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 better research when it comes to the the, the kicker competition. But I'll be ready by <laughs> July for training camp when it comes to that and give you roster battles and competition. But uh, it's definitely not Michael Basley's job. Well, I guess he's penciled it right now, but it's not in a Sharpie or so. They could be erased very quickly, especially a new coaching staff with Brandon Staley. Uh, but I think they kept him because they've seen what Michael Badger could do. He won games for them in 2018, 2019. And even last year, he won that. He had the game winner against the Falcons, I think, week 14. But last year was rocky because he missed the game winner against the Saints. He missed, I think, multiple crucial kicks against the Raiders in that thriller Thursday night game in Vegas. Uh, and his, uh, his, his leg strength is, is a problem. He, you know, he's very accurate in, inside of 45 yards. But when you go take him out to the 50-yard line, he struggles. I know in 2018, he made the franchise record 59-yarder. Uh, but ever since that, that game, I think he made four field goals that day. It was kind of a crazy game. He won that game. Uh, he struggled. And the weird thing about not just the, the leg strength, we've kind of already known that because sometimes he doesn't do the kickoffs and they leave it to the punter or the backup kicker and, and other situations. Mm-hmm. His confidence was kind of gone. That's what we call him the money badger because he, he had all this swag and he was very confident making game winners in Pittsburgh and stuff like that. And but he lost it a year ago. I know he spoke to us, the media and he said that, no, that's not, you know, he was saying that's not who I am. I was kind of down and, and he, we thought he kind of shrugged it off. But he kind of didn't. It was still a rocky overall season. So if you get that confidence, that swagger back, I think he'll be just fine and you could deal with the leg strength. But if he's if he's confident, accurate inside of 45, he, and you could rely on that guy, uh, especially for the Chargers who play one-score games all the time, hopefully that changes in mm-hmm. 2021, uh, you you can't count on a guy who whose confidence is broken. So for him, hopefully he figures it out in, uh, in training camp. Yeah, yeah. No one ever wants to talk kickers, but – they can be the difference from being a seven and nine team to a nine and seven or 10 and six team. So hopefully he gets it right and wins the job outright. Uh, but he did get extended. Um, and then Gilbert last thing before I get out to you, got to at least bring it up. Cause I uh, had a good career here in LA. Um, Ray Sean Jenkins signing with the Jaguars. Um, does this tell you that they believe in Nasir Adderley or do you think they'll still go after a veteran safety and maybe even address it in the draft? Yeah, you know, I don't know what, what happened with the John Johnson stuff. I thought it was going to be the obvious one, the, the former safety from the Rams who went to the Browns. And I, you saw reports about other teams interested, but the Chargers were not there. So maybe they did like Nas Adderley, who was a former second-round pick in 2019. And I think there was interest in Sean Jenkins going to, to the Jaguars because I think Sean and Nas had a good pairing. And, and Rayshon just added versatility. And after kind of going through the injuries with Derwin James, you know, you want to have – you know, more safety, especially when they could play both sides, strong safety and free safety. So that's why they went out to Rayshon. But it was kind of like it wasn't the end of the world. You know, if you don't want to go on our asking price, we have Nas Adderley here. You won't maybe they probably won't change a chase a big, you know, free agent outside because they had him already. And he but he struggled a year ago. Uh, he's very athletic. He did pretty well as a kick returner. But in terms of being an actual free safety, uh, communication, uh, awareness, uh, just, you know, timing, stuff like that was all off for him. But it was kind of his rookie year because his his real rookie year in 2019, he was hurt. He missed most of the year. So his real full-time playing was 2020. So Daly watched the film. He said, hey, I could work with this. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, I do think they bring maybe a vet in. I know one guy I've linked to the Rams a lot is Will Parks, but I could actually see him being a great fit um, for this Chargers team too, just because he can play both positions, can play nickel, has a connection with Brandon Staley from back when he was in Denver. So um, option as well there. Um but yeah, Gilbert Manzano, appreciate the time as always. I know it's a busy week, so uh, thanks for jumping on, talking some Chargers free agency, and uh, excited to see uh, you continue to grow with your uh, podcast and stuff too. So we'll talk soon. Sounds good, Ron. Thank you for having me on as always, man. Thank you always to Gilbert Manzano. My buddy does great work at the OC Register. As I mentioned, started a podcast, uh, Compas on the Beat, so make sure to check that out. Shout out to Sosa Cremendez for Lockdown Rams. Thanks for joining me. Thank you all for tuning in to the LA Football Podcast. Frost will be with me again later this week. I think I said that last episode, and then he decided to travel again, but he will be here with me 
later this week. And we've got some cool video announcements uh, for that episode, a new look for the LA football pod. It's going to look pretty awesome. I think you will all like it. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, video platform, hit that subscribe button on YouTube at LAFB network, or you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all at LAFB network. I am Ryan Dyer. Thank you for tuning in. This is the LA football podcast. Enjoy the rest of free agency. We'll hit all the news, all the info, all the analysis, and try to get some of these players on here in the coming days. Enjoy your Tuesday. Talk to you all in a few days.